we're going to talk about the importance of prayer today and uh, that prayer does make a difference and uh, in ways that in ways that we cannot imagine. Um, I did see a bulletin blooper to lighten the load a little bit here. Next Sunday, Mrs. Vinson will be our soloist for the morning service. The pastor will then speak on the subject, it's a terrible experience. <laughs> Remember, those are actual bulletin bloopers. <clears throat> Remember in prayer, the many who are sick of our church and community. <laughs> All right. Well, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that our steps are ordered by the Lord. And we thank you, O oh God, that when we cannot trace your hand, we can trust your heart. And we pray, Lord, for this uh, time together. This is not a wasted time. This is a, this is a time in which your spirit and you have a desire to impart wisdom, not just knowledge, but wisdom and uh, that wisdom and knowledge that can be utilized for our lives and for the expansion of your, your kingdom in us and through us. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right, let me get back to the right. We're going to pick up where we left off. We talked about what is prayer. So we talked about, we ended, we, we, I went off script a little bit. I got ahead of myself last week in talking about what is going on in prayer and um, how it is not just persuading God. If you remember correctly and you were here, we talked about the fact that, that we are cooperating with God, we are partners with God as we seek to see His will done on earth as it is in heaven. And um, we, we talked, I think, believe I talked about um, a book by S.D. Gordon that was very significant to change my life, written uh, after 1900, but uh, that I have the original, uh, an original copy of that book, and it's fantastic. So today we want to talk, we're going to go backward just a little bit. We're going to talk about who is involved in prayer. Now that may seem like a simplistic answer, or a simplistic question that, that is a, you know, obviously answered very easily. But reality is there may be more uh, entities involved in prayer than we at first may think. So we're going to talk about who is involved in prayer. And first of all, we're going to talk about God the Trinity. God the Trinity. Of course, we believe in a triune Godhead. In fact, that is even indicated, as we talked about early in some of our early lessons, indicated in the book of Genesis when God is speaking, so to speak, with himself. And he said, let us make man in our image. So that is indicative even in the beginning. Those are plural. When you go back into the original root language, that is plural, not singular. So that was not added by some modern translation. That is in the original that God referring to himself as, as more than one. And so from that, we come into what the Bible teaches, the triune Godhead, the Trinity. Do not try to figure it out. You won't. Brilliant theologians down through the centuries have tried to figure out how God can be three and yet God one. I've gone through some of those brilliant suppositions and, and analogies, but they all break down at some point. The egg, you know, I've had people say, well, it's just like an egg. Well, if you push that far enough, no, it's not. It's not like an egg. Or they'll talk about this, that, or the other. Let us put it into the category of those, um, those truths that push the limits of our own mind and, and help us to recognize God is greater than we are. His ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And He is infinite, and we are finite. And there's some, some truths that we just, we have to accept by faith. That God, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, is, is interesting, isn't it? That's what they pray, and yet God referring to himself, and, and then Jesus instructing us and baptizing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And so, and Jesus praying to the Father, 
Well, if, if there's not three, then Jesus was talking to himself, right? And so the, there is the, the reality of this. And so God, the Trinity, is involved in prayer. And it's interesting, although the activity of the Trinity cannot be neatly and concisely divided, meaning that only God the Father does this in prayer, only God the Son does this in prayer, and only God the Spirit does this in prayer, they do bleed, if we can use that terminology, into one another. It's seamless. But we do see truths given to us in the Bible that help us to understand the roles. And so for simplicity's sake, I've broken it down into God the Father, and I, I refer to God the Father as our source, our source. Uh, Jesus told us to think, and of course God the Father, uh, uh, Jehovah, Jesus told us to think of Jehovah as our Father. And in Matthew 6, 9, he told us in, in the Lord's Prayer, and this is how you then should pray, our Father who, are, who is in heaven. Now, this is, and again, we've talked about the fact heaven is not somewhere up yonder out there. Heaven is a dimension. And so you must not think that I'm praying to a God who's trillions of miles away. That's not accurate. God, one theologian said, God is closer than your very breath. God is closer to you than your very breath. And so God, God is everywhere at once. So you're not praying to a God on a throne way, way, way out there. And if we had a great big telescope, we could see him out there in heaven. He's, heaven is a dimension. And so our Father, now that was revolutionary. The, the Pharisees and the people of that day that loved God and followed him, when Jesus said that, that was considered blasphemy that he, you would call God. They didn't even pronounce his whole name. Even today they don't. Um, and so, and for, for Jesus' sake, call him Father, it just blew the religious people's minds of the day. Of course, it thrilled the, the common person who felt that God was, uh, you know, untouchable. And for them to know that God cared so much that he was, could be called Father. John, the book of John, by the way, the Gospel of John, um, John, the Gospel of John is, is different. Um, come on, brain. The Gospel of John is different from the other Gospels because the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are synoptic Gospels. In synoptic meaning they are much the same. You can find a continuity, a pattern through those three. But John completely breaks away. One of the themes of John is the fatherhood of God. So you'll see John referring to the fatherhood of God, the Father, God the Father, over and over again. So, in fact, in John, um, Jesus was talking about the Father, and I believe it's in Luke as well, where he said, do not be afraid. He called them little flock. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. So we'll look at the father as the source. We're to pray to the father. And then the son, in Matthew 6, 9, was a reference to the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, which is really a pattern prayer for us. And it, it is, <clears throat> we, we often memorize it. I think it's a good thing to memorize it. But the Lord's Prayer is really, I would liken to um, a, an outline of a prayer of different subjects and categories that you could base your own prayer life on. Holy is your name. It begins with praise. And so your prayer life can, can begin, your prayer life, Father, we thank, I thank you today for the opportunity to come to you. I thank you for all that you do. I thank you for what you've done in my life. I praise you. Come into his courts with praise. And so our Father, who, who, who you are in heaven, you're in that dimension, holy is your name, worthy of my praise. Um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Those are in a command form, by the way. It is not a, it is not a, not a form in the original, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, it almost sounds like it's a, a request, but it is a command in the original form. You remember, you're in partnership with God the Father. So if we put that into its original language, it would be, kingdom of God come. It's ordering it. Kingdom of God 
come. Will of God be done. That's what it is in the original language. So it's not just almost like asking the Father for his kingdom to come. It is you and I with him saying into a situation, kingdom of God, you can pray, come. In other words, activity of God. God, your kingdom, your angels, your will, come and be done in this. Be done in this situation. I'm facing a crisis here. Be done. So you have to personalize it. I prayed that this morning while I was getting ready for, for this to come here and to stu studying, trying to study for the service and this morning and received the phone call early. And on a personal note, I envisioned my mom's hospital room and I prayed God's kingdom come into that hospital room. God, your peace come. See, we need to learn how to pray. Your peace come into that room. You have authority in the name of Jesus. Lord, give my mother peace. Strengthen my sister. Give her strength. Kingdom of heaven come. And you don't have to necessarily shout it. I, uh, I, Pam was doing things, getting ready. I just I prayed that within myself. And, and thank Jesus, my sister said she's completely different this morning. Well, uh, you know, I'm believing that God answers prayer. And so this model, we won't go through the Lord's Prayer, but it, it is a pattern prayer that will be done on earth. You can, so you can take that, your will be done, kingdom come, you can take that any direction you want. You have a difficulty in your family, maybe your grandchildren are, are experiencing something, maybe, and, and there's, there's this, you need God's help. You can say, kingdom, kingdom of God, come. Come into their life. Come into this situation. Take control. Not the will of the devil, not the will of man. Will of God be done. Your will be done. See? Those aren't just empty words. We, God, Jesus gave us that to use. Not just to be a nice little prayer. Let's end the service with the Lord's Prayer. Okay? That's the problem with us. We have made everything so symbolic and religious and not practical, that we don't automatically think, I'm going to use that. He gave me that tool. I'm going to use that. Okay, I'm off and I'm, I'm off track. The Father is our source. The Son, that Jesus, is the intercessor, our intercessor. Jesus went on in John the 15th chapter, verse 16, he instructed his disciples, he t said, I tell you, and he uses two, two of the Godhead here. I tell you the truth, my father will give you, there's the source, whatever you ask in my name. So in the name of Jesus. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. Now, we don't need to get religious. I mean, when I mean, when I say religious, I mean, we get like Pharisees where we say we've got this formula. We're going to have to pray it this way, this way, this way. Listen, God isn't like that. I remember hearing my aunt when she was a teenage, a young teenager in a school bus in Shelby. And they were crossing the main, you wouldn't know the setup, but they were on Main Street crossing the tracks. Uh, the railroad, the main railroad tracks right behind Broadway and Main Street. And I don't know how she did this, but the school bus driver got out on the tracks, and they're wide tracks, and the gates came down right on the bus. And here was the train. Now, obviously, the school bus driver had made a big mistake. But Diana said she remembers the school bus driver simply saying, God help. That's all she said. Now, our God is not a God that says, well, you've got to pray that in Jesus' name. Here's a train coming, you know. You've got to end it in Jesus' name. No, God isn't like that. Jesus said he's our father. We wouldn't do that to our children, right? And so, and, and God answered prayer. That gate, and somehow they were able to get away from that gate. They weren't breakaway gates back then like they are now. They were heavy. And they, they got through and got away, praise the Lord. So, but Jesus is our intercessor. 
Romans 8.34 says Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us, representing us. That word is representing us. He represents you and I. And then Hebrews 7.25, therefore he is able to completely save those who come to him because he always lives to intercede for them. So Christ is the intercessor. He's, he's representing, he's, he's not just praying. You remember he said to Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. He knew Peter was going to deny him, but Jesus said, I have prayed for you. Um, I think we need to recognize that that term intercession not only means that he is um, praying, but he is representing us. When we come to the Father, we come through Jesus. There's no way into his holy presence without coming through Jesus. The veil that separated the Holy of, Hol holy of Holies from the um, holy place, the holy court, was torn in two right at the moment Jesus cried out, it is finished. So very, very symbolic of the fact, now you can imagine what the effect was on the worshipers, because no man could look into the Holy of Holies. The, the high priest only went in there on the Day of Atonement, and after the high priest, who had been selected, had prepared himself and over and over again through various ways, and then the high priest went behind the veil to offer sacrifice for the people, for the nation. And it, it is said that they had, uh, the veil went clear to the floor. You could not see. And the veil was so thick that the historian, Jewish historian Josephus, said that a team of horses could not pull, rip the veil. They say it was three inches thick of heavily woven fabric. And it was pitch black behind there. So until he, but, but it, the Bible records that the Shekinah glory was in there. So, I mean, it was a spine tingling moment for you as a high priest to walk into that Holy of Holies. And there was the Ark of the Covenant and, and the Ten Commandments inside of that. And so, um, but only once a year. But all of a sudden, when Jesus died outside the gates of the city during the Passover, and there's millions of people in Jerusalem, all of a sudden, from top to bottom, that's the real miracle, from top to bottom, meaning God did it. God ripped that veil open, and all of a sudden people are looking in there. Well, surely they thought, okay, I'm done. And to their amazement, they didn't die. Why? Because Jesus had paid the price for us to go directly into the presence of God. So when you and I address God our Father, the only way we get in there is because Jesus' blood has made the way open for us. So Jesus is our representative. And then the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, is our helper. And I have taught on this in the past, but paraclete, parakletos. is connected, um, joined. We say they have parasites. Paraclete is helper. So the helper who has been called alongside, Jesus said, so close that, that we even use the word parasite, so close. So the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, is our comforter, our helper. And um, Romans 8, 26 says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself 
intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Jude, the book of Jude says, 20 says, pray in the Holy Spirit. So that word helps. I'm going to do this just for fun. See if I can. Make sure I've got that right. No, I didn't. That's the Greek word. You have to be able to speak in tongues to say that word. <laughs> so we'll break it down here. Let's let's break it down. Um, soon um, is, well, let's, let's just, it means this. take hold of against together. When it says the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, it comes from a great big word, take hold of, of against together. How do we say that? In other words, the, the Spirit of God, when you are wrestling in prayer, when you are praying, when you're trying to pray, the Holy Spirit helps you not just with inspiration, but the Holy Spirit, the best way that, that the writer through the inspiration of the Spirit could describe it is the Holy Spirit, when you're trying to lift something, the Holy Spirit takes hold of it together with you. And, try, and if it's against, the Holy Spirit takes hold of it together with you against, if you're fighting a battle, and not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So remember, this all goes back to this cooperation and partnering with God, doing something mighty here on earth that the Holy Spirit takes hold of against together with us. Now, it even, it even means more. It says we do not know how to, but intercedes for us. Um, that word um, also means in the right time. Um, it uses, there's two words in the Bible, commonly used for time in the Greek. One is C-H-R-O-N-O-S. We've talked about this, I think. And the other is And so um, this means time in general, the passage of time, a chronometer, chronology. We keep a chronology. This is time. It could be, in, could be uh, interpreted the articulation of time. This is time. And kairos is that moment in time when it's a perfect moment. And the Holy Spirit helps us to pray in the right way in the perfect moment of time. How we should pray at that moment would be another way to say it. How we should pray at that moment. And so the Holy Spirit helps us. But this, of course, is as we are in tune with God. And I go back often to the scripture where, where God said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. 
In other words, he was saying so many people, there's so many tools, there's so many things available to them, but because they don't know, they suffer and they perish and they don't use or properly use what I've given them. So we are at uh, 10 o'clock and I've got just a 10 minutes to keep moving. The spirit of truth, Jesus said in John 16, 13. Uh, I didn't put that on there, but John 16, 13 says the spirit of truth. He will guide you. He will guide you. All right. Let me go back to laying a hold up together with us against. Um, it reminds me of a story of a mouse and an elephant that became friends. And the mouse had a habit of riding on top of the elephant everywhere. And the elephant went over a wooden bridge. And the bridge just shook and shook and shook and shook. And like it was going to give way. The elephant got over to the other side and the mouse said, boy, didn't we make that bridge shake? <laughs> So that's a good picture of how the Holy Spirit lays, lays hold of together with us against. The Holy Spirit is mighty, powerful, and it's not dependent, thank God, it's not dependent on your strength. He lays hold of with you together. All right, so who else is involved? Well, we know this, Satan is involved. The name Satan means adversary. It's translated adversary. It's translated accuser. It's translated opponent uh, in the Bible. The name Satan also means hater. Hater. So our, our adversary, Satan, the Bible says, as we've talked um, on several occasions now, in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, describes the fact that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And so, what does Satan and his organization have the power to do? How is Satan involved in your prayer life? How is he involved in your prayer life? Well, number one, let me go back for a second. Um, he, he can accuse you. And he is called, the last thing he's referred to is the accuser. Um, or in the, I shouldn't say the last, the last is deceiver, but he's the accuser. And I've counseled, I don't know how many people, down through the years, including myself, I've had to remind myself, that when thoughts come, how do they come? What is the characteristic, the personality of thoughts that are coming to you? If thoughts come to you consistently and seem to be a deep and, and continual presence and pressure, or is, it, is the thought traumatic, is it, is it critical, is it accusatory, is it accusation, does it elicit fear? Does it feel like an arrow Boom, hitting you? Boom. You know God doesn't love you. You know, boom. you know if God cared about you, this would... Boom. You know your prayers don't make any difference. You prayed... You remember when you prayed this and it didn't help? And you remember when you prayed that and it didn't help? Boom. Boom. Right? That's not from God. We have to learn to recognize the voice of the devil, the accuser of the brethren. It's a good sign because you're part of the kingdom. He wouldn't accuse you. But the Bible says to do what? Above all, hold high what? What's he, what, what weapon or what armor? The what? Hold high the... Sword. No. Shield. Shield. Shield of faith. You were close. Sword's the offensive weapon, but shield of faith. Why? So that you may quench the fiery darts of the wicked, of the enemy. And so he will accuse. But let's talk about what he will do. 
What can he do? And quickly wrap it up in five minutes. Number one, he can deter your prayers. And what do I mean by that? Stop you praying by any means. Stop you praying by any means. Do not ever underestimate the determination of the enemy to stop you praying. Any means he can, whether that be through accusation, whether that be through discouragement, whether that be through making you sleepy. Don't underestimate the power of the devil. <coughs> Pam is here and can wit and testify that I'm telling the truth. This isn't just a preacher's story. Uh, but when we get together, she will, she will read her Bible, have prayer, worship. I read my Bible, and, and I'll be doing some thinking, meditating, worshiping. And then we'll say, as you've heard me say before, one of us will say, or I usually say, hey, I'm ready to pray together if you're ready. She'll come in. I have not fought sleepiness or yawning. I may have been 45 minutes. Time after time after time after time, she comes in, sits down in the bed, and we both start to yawn. And I'll, and I'll be praying, and a desire to yawn will come over me. Listen, I don't want to be, I don't want you to think there's a, you know, the enemies. Of, but don't underestimate that if all of a sudden you feel sleepy, and you weren't sleepy before, and you fall asleep during prayer, the enemy wants to stop your praying. Get up and walk around. Throw cold water in your face. Deter. Number two, divert. If he can redirect your prayers into a pattern or a pathway that's ineffective and not spirit-led, you can pray, 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 pray. If he can get you to pray the wrong way and miss the mark and pray in the wrong direction, you can pray, 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 pray. He didn't mind if you pray. He'll divert your prayers. Number three, disturb. Interrupt your prayer life by a thousand different means and methods. Sometimes legitimately. I'm telling you, I don't think it's coincidence that sometimes the phone rings or something right when you've decided you're going to pray. So, I mean, he'll disturb. This is real to him. Your prayers are powerful, more powerful than you think they are. And he, he does not want us praying. I mean, he came against Jesus in the garden. And if he'll come against Jesus praying, he'll certainly come against you and I. Discourage you, again, to cause you to lose your faith and tenacity. Jesus said he hoped that men, he wanted men to always pray and not to faint. That word faint, give up. Well, if, if there's a tendency or if there's a temptation to give up, it means that we'll get discouraged. Discourage you and then delay. We talked about this before. And again, the classic illustration of this is Daniel. That if he, you say, does he have the ability to do that? I, unfortunately, I believe to a certain degree, the enemy has, has the, enough power to, if he can, delay the answer to your prayers. He did it with Daniel. And he's no, he, he'll, he'll come against you and I. That's why again and again and again, I would hear the old timers in the churches that I was raised in, the old prayer warriors, I would hear them say, I prayed through last night. Or I prayed through about this. And the answer's on the way. And I know it is. Last week, Someone stopped at, on the way out and uh, pointed their finger at me, rolled their window down, and I believe these were the words of God coming out of their mouth. They, they rolled their window down. They've never said anything like this to me before. They rolled their window down and they said, don't you stop. It's coming. It is coming. Don't you stop. It's going to come. And, and when they said that, I almost cried right there in the parking lot. I felt the presence of God really strong. So see, there's a, they call it breakthrough. There's a breakthrough coming. 
And so the, the enemy will try to delay. It doesn't mean you're praying wrong. If the Holy Spirit inspires you to pray a certain way and you can't get away from it, it doesn't make any sense. And you think and you keep hearing in your head, this is impossible. This is stupid. You're praying the wrong thing. This is dumb and other. But you can't get away from it. You just feel like this is how you're supposed to pray. That's the Holy Spirit telling you pray that way. Keep praying. Keep praying. And that breakthrough. One thing we don't do today is we're a microwave church and and we don't like delays and we don't like we're so busy doing everything else where the old timers, man, they'd stay on their knees. I'm glad I stayed on down on my knees till I prayed through my mother who's in the hospital used to sing that with me and my dad and my sister. I'll never forget that glorious feeling when I felt, and, and, and I prayed through. All heaven came down and glory abounded. The angels resounded when I prayed through. Amen. They knew how to pray through. We got to ask God to give us some of that and that we won't let go. You know, a bulldog's jaws are articulating. Did you know that? A bulldog can lay hold, a true bulldog can lay hold of, an, of a bull and will articulate its jaws without letting go. It can move itself up to the throat without letting go. A bulldog, and that's why they say they took hold of, like a bulldog. Well, you and I need to take hold like a bulldog and not let go and let God articulate our mouth until we get right to the jugular vein and God helps us to break through. Amen? All right. Made myself feel better saying that. All right, class. God bless you. Thank you for coming.